This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to a very special episode of Living History, a rare privilege. I'm here with Dr. Carl James, who is the Head of Military History at the Australian War Memorial, and we're going to go on a walk through one of the galleries of the War Memorial. He's going to point out some fascinating artefacts, some of his favourites there. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Carl, thanks so much for joining us on the program. Oh, no worries, Matt. Thanks for having me on yet again. Let's head into the gallery, mate, and see some things relating to the North Africa campaign. Carl, we're standing in front of a large and quite dramatic painting depicting Australian troops who are in not a good way. Um, what are we looking at here? So this is a, a rather large painting by Ivor Hill. Ivor Hill was an Australian official war artist and he's depicting a moment during the, the Australian capture of Bardia in January of 1941. Uh, and what we can see here is that this particular moment, the Australian infantry have broken through um, the Italian outer perimeter, taking one of the posts, post 11, and fish, fierce hand-to-hand fighting ensued. The Australians suffered some pretty heavy casualties taking this position. And as you can see in the composition of the, photo, of the artwork... In the centre, there's an, a wounded Australian soldier uh, who's actually Joe Gullett, who would become quite a significant figure in his own right. And around him are dead and wounded Australians as well as dead and wounded Italians. While we tend to think about the First Living campaign as a little bit of a walkover, um, it's pretty. we always need to remember that an Italian bullet will kill you just as effectively as a German or a Japanese bullet or artillery shell. So it's, I think it's one of those great evocative moments from the first Libyan campaign that shows you just the ferocious and the intensity of the fighting. And it doesn't shy away from really the brutality of combat. You can see even there in artwork, men wounded, men in agony, they're struggling, they're suffering. And this is, a, you know, this is the gritty reality of war. When I was a kid and I first was coming to the War Memorial, it was paintings like this that really uh, excited and frightened me in equal measure. Do we still have... I mean, we've got a great tradition of, of artwork, of official artists depicting battles. Does this still go on today in modern conflicts? Oh, absolutely. So the War Memorial has been very active in sending its official war artists on operational deployments, so to into Timor, the Solomon Islands, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, we just had a group go over to the Middle East, look what the Australian observers are doing with the United Nations or with um, peacekeeping operations. So there's quite a long tradition of war art, and of course that goes back to the First World War. I think the thing, one of the uh, reasons why this painting in particular is striking and evocative is there's a heroic pose to it. Um, Joe Gullett is laid out in a cross, almost Christ-like in terms of sacrifice. But this is not glorifying war. Look at the, the faces in the body. They are wrangling in pain, mouths are open, eyes are closed. It's a pretty, it's an incredibly violent scene. It's not graphic but the violence is certainly there for people to see. So it brings that moment to life. It helps to visualise it because from our point of view as the viewer, we are inside. So Heel has placed us inside the concrete post. Barty was protected by a ring of fortification, so concrete bunkers and posts such as this. They had overhead uh, cover with timber. Outside there was barbed wire, um, landmines and the like, which Australians broke through to get to this position. So it's informative, it's evocative, but it's in no way glorifies war. Or what happened? It would have been fairly confronting for both veterans of that campaign and their families to see this in the post-war years. Oh, you have to think so. This is the almost like the selfie of the day. Um, so the painting itself was painted in 1967, but Ivor Hill was with the Australians in 1941, so he knew these men intimately. He served in the ranks before his commission as an official war, an official war artist, uh, and the person too who features in the sense of Joe Gullett. So he was the son of Henry Gullett. Henry Gullett was uh, he wrote the Sino Palestine a volume of the official history from the First World War. Um, he was later on killed in the Canberra air crash disaster in 1940. Joe Gallett was there. He serves in the ranks. He enlisted as a private soldier, um, served in the Middle East, New Guinea, commissioned from the ranks. And on the 6th of June 1944, he was an Australian on attachment to the British Army and he landed in Normandy in France uh, and saw the rest of the war fighting with a British unit. It's just a wonderful thing. Shows, again, the depth and variety um, of the Australian experience in the Second World War. So you think, here's this digger, and he was a digger at that time, um, serving in Libya, goes to New Guinea, fights against the Japanese, and then later on he's fighting against the Germans in occupied France. It's why the Second World War and our experience in the Second World War is so uh, varied and so diverse. One of the things the War Memorial is well known for is its wonderful dioramas, which really brought to life those First World War battles, Lone Pine and Pozier and Mont St. Quentin. Um, but we're standing in front of another one now depicting the siege of Tobruk. Tell us about this, Carl. 
as part of that continuation of involving and interpreting the story and trying to bring the war to life, uh, when they did a bit of during the night, from the 1960s onwards, the Memorial commissioned a large number of Second World War dioramas. Um, we all remember the the First World War dioramas, for example, the taking Attack on Lone Pine is just phenomenal, an artwork, and it's evocative, and you're right there in the moment. And they try to continue that tradition across when doing the Second World War. Now, over time, the, the Second World War dioramas haven't really fared as well, um, but one of those remaining um, experiences or dioramas, really, is the, the Tobruk diorama. Uh, and it's something to keep in mind that during the siege of Tobruk, so from April through to December 1941, one of the, the longest sieges in British military history, it's also one of the few high points or highlights of the 1941 campaign in the desert. Tobruk's garrison withstood German, repeated German and Italian attacks. And it could only do that because it's being resupplied by the Navy with supplies coming in uh, into Tobruk Harbour itself. In many ways, Tobruk was fought on two fronts. You had the Red Line, so the, the fortified outer line in the desert, where, which was largely defended by Australian infantrymen. And then the second front was the battle for the harbour. And that's what we see in this large diorama here. If you visualise it, you have an anti-aircraft gun. Um, there's Rex in Tobruk Harbour itself with a hate with HMS Ladybird, um, which is in the foreground. And Ladybird was a ship that was sunk into Brook Harbour. It rested on the seabed. Its upper deck was still visible. And the British maintained anti-aircraft guns. So it became a, an anti, a static anti-aircraft gun platform for much of the siege. And this is what we see in this um, moment. Now, some fun facts. While it's a pretty big diorama and quite impressive to look at, it's also probably the only diorama where the only individual figures we see are non-Australian. Um, you have five gunners around the anti-aircraft gun. The sculpture itself is based on a series of photographs that were taken by very famous photographer Damien Perra. And in Damien Perra's notes, in his um, dope sheets, when he, so the documentation that when he's writing the captions for the photographs, he makes a note saying that the gunners were all Scotsmen. So here we have a, this great, in the Australian War Memorial, um, a, a featuring Scottish gunners. But it's a really good reminder too that the siege of Tobruk, why, one of the reasons why it's important is because it's not just an Australian story. We have Brits there, you have Czechs, Poles. Um, I've found some individual Canadian RAN officers who are working in the harbour. It's a big multinational. It's a, it was a coalition effort. And certainly in the foreground, we've got some Scottish anti-aircraft gunners. And I believe, too, that over many, many years, the Rats of Tobruk Association um, were pretty vocal in how they just didn't like this diorama because it didn't reflect their experience. So the ACT branch of the Rats of Tobruk Association um, thought this wasn't their war. Their war was in the desert. It was in the outer line, the red line. It was in that fierce fighting around the salient. It wasn't necessarily in the harbour uh, or in the Tobruk township itself, which for much of the siege was actually an out-of-bounds area. Um, because it was constantly being bombed and shelled, you didn't want diggers just milling around, getting into trouble, or exposing themselves needlessly to, to becoming a casualty. One of the reasons why Tobruk resonates is because of the spirit of defiance and make doness of the diggers themselves. Um, uh, their ability to improvise, to live below ground, to make do with the equipment that was laying around, so a lot of, well captured I should say, uh, a lot of abandoned and captured Italian equipment and a really evocative way we've just depicted those qualities and stories in the galleries here is this uh, lorry breeder gun combination. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a Chevrolet lorry, um, so this is a standard type of British truck that was used by the British forces in the Second World War, used by Australians at Tobruk uh, and mounted on the back of the, on the bed, so the tray of the lorry, you have a 20 millimeter Italian anti-aircraft gun. So basically, visualise a ute with a big gun stuck in the back. And again, this is one of those great little uh, moments of improvisation that the garrison carried out. There was an Australian light anti-aircraft battery. So you had Australian trained gunners, but they didn't have their own British guns. So they used captured Italian guns as well as ammunition. And they wanted to experiment with mobile, a form of mobile um, air support, mo anti-aircraft support give them some mobility, give them some more punch. So for a period, they experimented by mounting an anti-aircraft gun on the back of a truck and then driving through the desert. What's the advantage of doing that? Well, it, move, it means that the anti-aircraft gun isn't static, so German and Italian aircraft won't know to attack one fixed position. What's the danger? Well, you're standing on the back of a moving truck, being shot up, being bombed. You could fall off. You could be wounded by de uh, debris, rocks, it was incredibly dangerous, but um, so short-lived, it wasn't very successful. 
but it just shows that spirit of improvisation, just trying things out, and the, the willingness to use your captured German Italian equipment. Now, on the side door of the lorry, so there was a real useful military function purpose to it. Also, a little bit of com- comedy as well, you know, the spirit of larrikin. So, this one particular battery, they moved around a lot. Um, they often used, in addition to using Italian equipment, wore bits and pieces of Italian clothing, Italian hats. And because they were mobile, they had the nickname of uh, a mobile circus. Their battery commander was a bloke called Major Stokes. And so, the nickname for the unit was Stokes' Travelling Circus. And so what we have here on the side door of this lorry is a little silhouette of a ballerina in a tutu standing on top of a horse with a triangle that says STC, and that's for Stokes' Travelling Circus. So this is a little nod to that battery. How do we know to put that silhouette on the side door? When we were working, and I was part of the team then to, to put this vehicle on display in the gallery, we are doing some research, looking through photographs, looking through published books, the battery had a published unit history and I was flicking through it and I saw this little silhouette and I thought, oh, that's a great, that would make a great stencil. Had the, the name of the bloke who wrote that chapter in the book and then I just went to the Yellow Pages. Now, this is about 10 years ago. Went to Yellow Pages, same name, um, there were initials and surname and I just rang him up, totally out of the blue. We had this great chat around um, his experiences being in Tobruk, being an anti-aircraft gunner. I asked him about the silhouette because I knew it existed, but I wasn't really sure what the size was. I was like, was it on the passenger door? Was it on the driver's side door? Was it on both doors? And he was like, oh, Sonny, I don't remember. There's only two of us left and no one's going to complain. <laughs> I was like, all right, cheers, thanks, Digger. Uh, and, and that's the story of how we got Stokes' Travelling Circus. Now, that in itself, at the time, I knew it was a real privilege because I could just look up this veteran in the phone book and make contact, just reach out to him out of the blue. And he gave me a great yarn. We shared some experiences, and that's reflected in, um, in the galleries. But we couldn't do that today because um, that veteran's now passed, and that living connection with Tobruk and, and the Second World War just doesn't really... Um, we're down to the last tens, I think, of Tobruk veterans. So the generation has now passed away. But that's one of my great little moments of my contribution to the gallery being directly informed by the veteran experience. It's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful item, the centrepiece of the whole display. And I should say, uh, visit the uh, Living History Facebook page and we'll have photos up of all these items and Carl showing us around. This is a very evocative display, Carl. We're looking at a lifeboat which is effectively torn apart by shrapnel damage. And this has obviously been through some pretty heavy combat tell us the story of this boat yeah this is one of the i think the more evocative objects in the second world war galleries and probably one of the most significant Uh, so we're looking at the shell torn bullet ridden carly float from hmas sydney 2 so while the galleries do tend to focus on the army's experience the royal australian navy deployed to the mediterranean in 1940 and were they were the first engaged so that the navy had its first victories against the italians before the army in the Mediterranean, HMA Sydney 2 performed sterling effort. It was engaged in um, the Italian destroyer, the Espresso, as well as a Bartolio Corleone. Um, it was really the... Sydney was the pride of the Royal Australian Navy. It came back to Australian waters in the second part of 1941. And then the night of the 19th of November 1941, Sydney was lost in the action against the German raider Cormoran. A few days later, Sydney was overdue, it disappeared, and then some German sailors were found in, um, in ships and small boats and the like, and that kind of triggered the search for HMA Sydney. Now, at the time, nothing of Sydney was found at all. There was no oil slicks, there was no debris. The only thing that was recovered in searches was this Carly float. So for some 60-plus years, the Carly float, this Carly float we're looking at right here was that only real tangible link, that last connection with the loss of HMA in Sydney too, and some 645 men who died that night. So it's a very powerful object for that very reason. And from the history of the War Memorial itself, Sydney was lost in late... Well, the memorial opened on Remembrance Day, or it was then Armistice Day, 1941. Um, Sydney was lost in action a week later. A month later, you have the South Pacific War. And so the Carly Float went and displayed in the memorial's galleries in about 1943, 1944. So it's really the first object from what was then a, the Second World War, which was then a contemporary current conflict, to go on display in what was then a museum to the First World War. So it's significant from a, the battle point of view, a story of Australia's loss, but also from a museumology point of view and how the memorial has always really had to struggle for, to tell the space and to give everything um, the appropriate area and an appropriate treatment. Carl, we're looking at a slouch hat 
absolutely covered in badges. It must be fairly significant, I'm gathering. And also pretty heavy too. I don't think it'd be very comfortable. Um, so what we're looking at is Monty Slouch Hat. Now, this is a slouch hat that was presented to um, uh, General Sir Bernard Montgomery after he took over command of the 8th Army in 1942. So Montgomery was easily one of the... Well, I won't say outstanding, but certainly one of the more controversial British generals from the Second World War. Um, he really came to prominence during the Second Battle of El Alamein from October through November. And part of Monty's characteristics was his showmanship. You know, he presented himself as a great military leader. I mean, he was, but he also knew how to play the part, play the role. And the thing with the Eighth Army was it reflected the entire British Empire. So you have British units, you have Australian units, New Zealand division, South Africans, Rhodesians, um, all Indians, of course. The British Indian Army was massive. So as a way to bring his coalition force together, Monty went around, spent a lot of time visiting the different units, visiting the troops, uh, and he embraced their little characteristics. So when he visited the Australians, the Australians presented him with an Australian slash hat, um, which Monty then kept, took off the hat band, and then he adorned it with all the regimental badges and crests from all the different units under his command that made up 8th Army. A very noble gesture. However, I believe um, some of his British officers thought he looked a bit silly. And thereafter, the tank corps presented Monty with his what would then become his famous Black Beret. And so he went from wearing a slouched hat adorned with different badges and the like through to becoming just wearing a Black, uh, a black Beret. But it was one of those characteristic qualities from the early part of the Desert War. War. Um, and it's a really signified too, a reminder that the Australians were there as part of a much wider force. It wasn't just Australia alone in the desert. We were there with what was then the British Empire. Which brings me to why I think um, the challenge of talking about El Alamein. So much of what we do is thinking about what to remember and why to remember it. So Tobruk is a household name still, or at least the rats of Tobruk. Uh, Tobruk is an important action during 1941. However, I do feel and have argued that it's really our involvement with El Alamein that was the most significant thing Australia did on the battlefield. El Alamein was one of those turning points in the Desert War, and it was a, a real... The end of the beginning is how Winston Churchill defi- described it. The 9th Division during this action was key. We had the northernmost position fighting around the Tel El Isa railway station. And that's by... We ended up bringing in the German forces. The fight went for about a week. The 9th Division was very heavily engaged, um, and it became a pivot point. It was thought to be key. Rommel reinforced the fighting near where we are, which weakened his massive line and then allowed Monty to punch through elsewhere along the El Alamein line. Alamein itself, though, is a really complicated battle and in many ways our experience and our story gets lost. It's easier to talk about Tobruk in terms of an Australian story, but when we look at the Australian story at El Alamein, it really gets lost in that wider British Commonwealth story. But I would encourage all listeners, if you're interested in really thinking about and thinking critically about our involvement in the war to really champion El Alamein. That's the, where we really step up in the world stage, or at least within the, the empire, and are at that key role, at that key moment, playing the, at the key time. Yeah, so just to wrap up our 1941 tour of the galleries, or, or our highlight tour, uh, I just thought I'd bring you here, Matt, to have a look at the Victoria Cross and Medal group of John or Jack Edmondson, VC. So Jack Edmondson is well known because he was the first um, Victoria Cross awarded to an Australian during the Second World War. It was awarded in a, an action where he died of his wounds on the night of the 13th of April, 1941, um, as the Germans are besieging Tobruk. A small German party of machine guns break through the defensive line. Jack Edmondson and his section are told to go out and deal with the German machine gunners. Lieutenant McKell is leading the group. The Australians charge the Germans. McKell is wounded. Um, he's rustling. He's, he's fighting against the German. Jack Edmondson himself is wounded in that initial rush forward as well. Jack kills the German, runs over to his lieutenant, um, saves his lieutenant, kills the German, um, but he's mortally wounded. He's dragged. Edmondson's dragged back to the post uh, and he subsequently dies of his wounds. So incredibly brave um, action on Edmondson's part, heroic, saved the life of his officer. And he subsequently, with actually only within a few weeks actually, he's awarded the Victoria Cross. That's the first one for Australia. And Jack goes from being a normal soldier through to our first national hero, for want of a better word. Now, so this story I think is interesting. One is the first Victoria Cross. Another reason why I think it's worth 
discussing. It's because if we see here, we have his Australia bar, which he wore on his shoulders, as well as the Rising Sun badge. Now, there's a really strong connection between the first Australian Imperial Force from the Great War and the second Australian Imperial Force of the Second World War. That's why when the war begins in 1939, 1940, uh, we, we, the army goes from the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th Division. There's a, a continuity and a tradition. And we see that right here because... Jack Edmondson's uncle served in the First World War in the 1st 17th Battalion, um, so he served in the Infantry in the Western Front, and the Australia Bar and the Rising Sun Badge. So his uncle wore that in the First War, and then Jack Edmondson wore the same Bar and Rising Sun Badge in the Second World War. So you have this great continuity. Now, the other thing why I think the Edmondson story is really quite interesting is that he was particularly close to his mother. So when, um, and his mother didn't want Jack to join the army, didn't want him to go overseas, but Jack being a young man had his own way, and she was like, oh, okay, well, we can go, um, but we'll keep a diary. I'll keep a diary, and you keep a diary, and then when we get back, when you get back from the war, we'll swap notes, and we can fill in the story, and we know what, what, what we got up to. So Jack was from Liverpool, country boy then, in the out, what was then the out, outskirts of Sydney, and Jack was, all right, mum, no worries. Um, so his mother kept a diary every day he, he was away. But then Jack, being a young man in his 20s, he started the diary and then just went, pfft, you're nut. Now, it's interesting because, so she, throughout 1940, 1941, normal daily entries, and then round about the time of April 1941, she has this premonition. She has a really bad day and she had this premonition. The cat knocked over the milk. She had a bad night's sleep and she felt really unsettled. And in her diary, she's recording all of this in her diary, and in... in at the end of the 13th of April, about 12th of April, she says, something has ha- I had a really bad day. All these things happened. A lot of bad luck. Something has happened to Jack. And that happened at the same time where Jack is then killed and dies at Tobruk. It's not until a week later that she, she and the family receive a telegram saying that Jack was killed in action. And then it's a little while later after that, the notification about the Victoria Cross. So we have in this mother's diary, her own premonition, essentially of her own son's death. And that's all captured in the personal diary. It's incredibly moving and powerful. And it's a reminder too that while we're talking about the experience of soldiers serving overseas, there's also the flip side of that is that the home front story, it's about mums and dads who have got their sons and husbands and partners overseas. There's more to there's more to our military story than just our soldiers. So it's a really powerful story. And the other interesting thing too with the her, his mother's collection she kept his scrapbook and a diary as well as a diary she's kept a scrapbook so all the newspaper clippings about her son about the investiture of the family with the medal um, the governor general gave the medal or awarded the medal to or presented the medal I should say to Jack's father but he knew that Jack was much closer to his mother so he passed it on to Jack's mum and you see in the scrapbook too the transition of, from her son being her son through to it being a national hero. So it's a, a great little time capsule as to how these things play out. They're not just a, a bronzed Anzac hero. They are someone's son. And there's always, always a great deal of loss and sadness associated with these other um, so-called heroic moments. Well, it's the one thing that the War Memorial does really well, Carl, is the uh, those personal stories. And it's something that I encourage people to come here whenever they're in Canberra, engage with the story. But this has just been a rare privilege, a treat, walking around with a, a man who's just put so much heart and soul into these exhibitions. So, Carl, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you. And that was only 1941. <laughs> Thanks, Carl.